Welcome to the church. I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday experience. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with him, connects you in your daily experience as we advance his kingdom. As this word encourages you, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment on all platforms. Up for Pentecost conference. All right. So if you have not raised your hand, don't worry. We still have tickets available. You can pick them up today after experience. We'll be selling them in TC Central. Well, I'm excited to be here today. How many of you are excited to be here today? Yes. Come on, man. Come on. Because I don't know when my time is up. I don't know when it's up. But until that time, I'm going to keep giving God praise and honor and glory. So how many of you are excited that you are still alive today? Come on, somebody. Man. Remember this back in the day? God is good. And all the time. And I love you. That. I love doing that. All right. My name is Sonny Torres. I'm the lead servant here at the church where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. If you want my notes today, I will share them. Don't worry. Text TC notes to 77411 and you can get all the notes. There's been a running joke, a running joke about when is Pastor Sonny going to preach this message? This is the third try, the third go at it. We are preaching this message, Chloe Hager. <laughs> Chloe Murillo, Murillo. I'm sorry. Sorry, Jacob. She, she got married to Murillo, so she's Murillo. Chloe Murillo. Well, we are preaching this message finally. Uh, trust me when I say the first time we were going to preach this message, the Lord says, no, you're not ready. Then the second time I was going to preach this message, the Lord says, no, they're not ready. And so now the third time we're going to preach this message, God says, now you are all ready. All right? So, if you have your Bibles, please open them up to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. And as custom, we will stand at the reading of God's word. We're going to do some Bible reading this morning. How about that, y'all? Yeah. How about that? Some old school Sunday school. That's how I learned all these stories was Sunday school. Yeah, there was a, such a thing as called Sunday school. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. So, here we go. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they weighed laid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women. Yeah, he said that. Children and infants, cattle. Oh, come on. Cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Now I want you to jump to verse 7 of that same chapter. It says, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But, someone say but. But, but Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, uh, right? Everything that was good, these they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything else that was despised and weak they totally destroyed then the word of the Lord came to Samuel I regret that I made Saul king because he has turned away from me and he has not carried out my instructions Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night and I want you to jump to verse 13 of that same chapter and when Samuel reached him he went to Saul that's right Saul said the Lord bless you <laughs> I've carried out the Lord's instructions but Samuel said what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What's this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites, and they spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Okay, okay, tell me, Saul said. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, and wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Come on. 
And now, I want you to jump to the New Testament. Go to Acts. That's right. We're going to go to Acts. We're going to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at verse 1. Here we go. Acts, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing. What? 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 Hold on a second. We got another Saul. We got another Saul. That's right. Uh, verse. Uh, verse. Uh, one, here we go. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. God, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women, and he put them into prison. Now I want you to jump to chapter 9, looking at verse 1, 1 through 6, chapter 9. Here we go. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, oh, that's the church, y'all, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice to him say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Jump to verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell off Saul's eyes and he could see again and he got up and he was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now I want you last to go to verse chapter 13. And verse 1, and it says, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. There was, ready, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lu Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me at Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Wow. Let us pray, church. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is food for us, Lord God. It is bread for us. It sustains us, Lord God. It gives us strength, Lord. It teaches us, Lord God. So we rely, we depend, Lord, we stake our life on your word. So teach us your way, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name and all of God's people say, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. There are two people in scripture that we're going to focus on today, if you haven't guessed it already. We've got Saul of the Old Testament, we read about, who was anointed the first king of Israel, right? God had anointed him to be king of Israel. And then we've got Saul of the New Testament. Now, he was a Pharisee and a rabbi of God's law. A lot of times people will misinterpret Saul of the New Testament thinking that he was a sinner, Right. Thinking that, you know, he was a, a, a murderer in the negative aspect. But no, Saul of the New Testament was a teacher of the law. He was a rabbi. So the purpose of this message, church, is not to give you the entire biblical uh, story of these two men. For, for that's something that I encourage you that you go and you read, right, in your daily experience. But or, in order that you might understand the purpose of this message, these passages in Scripture about these two Saul's, they've been highlighted for you today. It's clear that both were men of God. That they both acknowledged God, King Saul and Saul of the New Testament. From the passages we read in scripture about King Saul, God had chosen him as the first king of Israel. And it's clear that Saul's desire, this king, was to please God in the way he thought was best. 
But Saul of the New Testament was a teacher of God's law, right? He was brought up to know and learn of the Old Testament. He was under teachings of rabbis. What's ironic is that this Saul of the New Testament probably read stories of King Saul. Right? This Saul grew up with a desire to know God and teach about God. So it's clear, right, that each of these men had a desire to know God. They had a desire for God. And so since this is a season to hunger and thirst for more of God, right, let's use a food analogy to describe their zeal for God. How about we say that each of them had a sweet tooth for God? How about that? But what does that phrase sweet tooth actually mean? Well, it means this. It means a liking for something that is sweet to the taste. It also means a weakness for sweets. How many of you have a weakness for sweets? I got a weakness for sweets. I got candy in my side table hiding from my children. I don't want them getting my Skittles and my M&M's. Come on. Some of you parents, you know what I'm talking about. You got to hide food from your kids, especially your candies. And the Lord says, bring your best. I leave my best uh, uh, candy in the side table. My kids can't take it. I've come to tell you, church, that as believers, we should always have a sweet tooth for God's way in our life. God's way should be to our liking. God's word should be our weakness. Come on, somebody. We should be able to say in all sincerity, I have a weakness for following God's commands. I can never say no to God. Scripture says it in Psalm 119, 103. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How many of you have a sweet tooth for God's word? How many of you have a sweet tooth for God's way? Yeah. Well, but hidden under that righteous zeal, church, I've come to tell you, there can also be a zeal to please your flesh. Uh Uh-oh, stepping on some toes this morning. Each of these souls, they had a sweet tooth, church, or a liking and a weakness for something other than God. You see, church, the point of this message is for you to take some inventory today as to what it is that you have a sweet tooth for. Because is it for holiness or does it displease the Lord? Because if you want to properly hunger and thirst for righteousness, then you have to identify and you have to address that which your flesh has a liking or a weakness for. You have to identify and you have to address what keeps getting in the way of your zeal for living according to God's Word. It's not enough to just identify it, church. It's not enough just to know what it is, but you have to address what it is. You have to take into action what it is that is keeping you from going all the way for Jesus. Let's look at the two Saul's. Let's look at their sweet tooths of the flesh, shall we? Let's look at them. We have two Saul's in the Bible. I, I don't know about you, but I just always found it quite interesting that there were two Saul's in the Bible. There was one in the Old Testament, and there was one in the New Testament. And I just began to think over the years, over my life, I began to think about, Lord, what were the similarities of these two Saul's? And then I began to think, Lord, what what were the differences of these two Saul's? And and what what, what is it, Lord, that you're trying to say? I mean, is it it by coincidence, church, that we have two Saul's in the Bible? I don't think so. I think God is very, I think he's very intentional about what he does. And he's just waiting for us to wake up and say, Lord, teach me your way. Right? It's apparent that King Saul had a sweet tooth for power and title. He had a sweet tooth for his way according to what? His thinking. It's apparent that King Saul had a sweet tooth for sacrifice, but not so much for obedience. Why were you in my notes today? Come on, Alan. Saul of the New Testament, though, it is apparent had a sweet tooth for sticking to the old law. The old way of doing things. He had a sweet tooth for following God's law to the letter. He had a sweet tooth for opposing any who tried to bring disruption to the way that things had always been. By any means necessary. We just read that. That he he stood in approval of Christians who were killed because they were trying to oppose 
The law of the letter, the letter of the law, whatever you want. Moses comes down the mountain, 10 commandments. They're opposing Moses. This Saul, this Saul in the New Testament, he didn't have a sweet tooth for change. So if these two men of God, church, if they were holy men, believers of God, and if they still had a sweet tooth for something that was keeping them from fully hungering and thirsting after God's way, well, then the question I have to ask this morning is, as a believer, as a believer, do you, as a believer, have something that is keeping you from hungering and thirsting fully for God? Do you have a liking for something that is keeping you from obeying God fully? Not talking about the sacrifice. We're talking about the obedience part, church. Do you have a weakness for something that you know is not of God? Listen closely, church. These were men of God and still they had a sweet tooth for the flesh. They had a weakness just because you get saved. That doesn't mean that all those urges suddenly disappear. Now, salvation, that's the first step you take. But deliverance from that sweet tooth that you have habited in your life, that church is called the process. And it can happen, church. All that sweet tooth of the flesh will come out of you if you believe and you declare it in Jesus' name. We're not here today to continue to hold on to our sweet tooths of the flesh we are here today to acknowledge them and address them church for those of you who are taking inventory right now and you feel as though you know i'm good in the hood i'm good or you're from the suburbs i'm superb <laughs> in the burbs I don't know where you come from, the hood of the burbs. I don't know. You think you're good. I'm all right. I'm all right. All right. Well, let me go ahead and let me, let me just get into your business because I've been with the Lord. <laughs> Do you have a sweet tooth for fear? How about a sweet tooth for doubt? What about a sweet tooth for rushing into anxiety? Be honest, church. Does this sound like you? I know I shouldn't think this way, but sometimes I just can't help it. How about a sweet tooth for crumbling under pressure? What about giving in to depression? How about losing your temper? Mm. Do you have a sweet tooth for road rage? How about saying things you wouldn't say if you knew that God was in the room? I got news for you. He's in the room with you all the time in everything that you do. Right. Do you have a sweet tooth for old bad habits? Do you have a sweet tooth to look and lust after things or people? Do you have a sweet tooth just to look? I just want to look. Do you have a sweet tooth to see if you still got it even though you are married? Do you have a sweet tooth? Do you have a sweet tooth to, to, to think negatively about a situation? Do you have a sweet tooth for lack of faith? Do you have a sweet tooth for insecurity? Do you have a sweet tooth for settling? Come on. Do you have a sweet tooth for just giving up? Do you have a sweet tooth for believing for everyone else according to scripture? You believe for everyone else that it can happen. But when it comes to you and your family and your marriage and your finances, that you just don't have the faith for. Is your weakness drama? Are you drawn to gossip? Is your, to is your sweet tooth running away? I mean, what's the longest job you've kept? What's the longest relationship you've kept? Some of you are more committed to your novellas and your Hallmark channel. Come on, somebody. What's the longest you stayed at a church? What's the longest you stayed in personal one-on-one -on -one counseling? Listen, somebody, at some point, you are going to have to realize not everyone is the problem. You the problem. You're going to have to look yourself in the mirror and say, yo, we got to have a meeting today. Right. Come on, church. Do you have a sweet tooth for excuses? Do you have a sweet tooth for having it your way? What's this, Burger King? Come on, somebody. Do you have a sweet tooth for lying? Big lie. Small lie. Sometimes lie. Every now and again lie. 
Very far and few between lie. Exceptions to the rule lie. Lie to make others feel good. You've got an excuse for every kind of lie. But nevertheless, church, I come to tell you, it's a lie. And it's your weakness. And if you have a sweet tooth for it, I've just described you. Do you have a sweet tooth to cheat? On your spouse? Yes, you girlfriends and boyfriends too. On your taxes? On an application? Come, How bad do you want? Do you really need the job that bad? You're going to cheat your way? How about on your job? Do you have a sweet tooth for laziness? Do you got a sweet tooth for procrastination? Do you have a sweet tooth for not accepting the truth? John 8, 32, Jesus said it like this. You shall know the truth. Why? It's supposed to set you free. The truth shall set you free. So when godly people come into your life and they give you the truth, I'm here to tell you, bro, sis, it's not to offend you or make you mad or belittle you. My friend, it is to set you free. The church and all its leaders and pastors are trying to get you to see the truth and know the truth according to God's word so that you can live a free life. God designed truth to set you free. One of the greatest tricks of the enemy is to keep you from knowing the truth. He's been doing this since the garden, y'all. Here's the truth. You want some truth? Let me tell you. You need to come to church consistently. That's some truth. Here's some more truth. You need to tithe. Here's some truth. You need to forgive others and communicate with those who offend you. That's right. You need to stop having sex before marriage. Come on, somebody. You want some more truth? You need to accept your God-given gender. You need to parent your kids. You need to read your Bible every day. You got to pray. You need to fast regularly. Come on, church. This is a season of hunger and thirst. It's teaching us to what? Fast. Fast. Not eat fast, but fast. Come on. It's not for the select few. This season is for everybody. Everybody. No one is exempt from fasting. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, not if you fast. But I can't do it, pastor. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Come on, you can fast. Here's some more truth. You need church community. You're not meant to do life alone. I'm here to tell you, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, then go with godly people. Go with the church. Let's go with you. Come on, somebody. You shall know the truth, and the truth is supposed to set you free. Do you have a sweet tooth for going back to the old ways and old habits? Do you have a sweet tooth for thinking the worst of a situation? Do you have a sweet tooth for thinking the worst of people? Do you have a sweet tooth for being argumentative? Do you have a sweet tooth for money? Come on. Do you have a sweet tooth for power and title? Do you have a, a weakness for people's approval? Do you have a sweet tooth for attention? Do you have a sweet tooth to be appreciated? Do you have a sweet tooth for lack of self-control? Do you have a weakness for rushing into things? Do you got a weakness for surrounding yourself with the wrong people? Do you have a weakness for saying yes when you know God told you to say no? Do you have a sweet tooth for butting into people's business? Do you have a sweet tooth for trying to always save the world? Someone needs to put a cape on some people. Because I guess you Superman or Superwoman. Come on, somebody. Do you have a sweet tooth for always being right? Do you have a sweet tooth for always having something to say? Do you have a sweet tooth for interfering on your adult children? I just come to say, mom and dad, if you die, what's going to happen to them? Well, I guess they're going to have to figure it out. They're going to have to figure it out. They're going to have to figure it out. So here's what I'm trying to tell you, mom and dad of adult parents. I'm just trying to tell you, if you want to witness the greatest miracle in your children's life, then hear God say, move, get out the way. Get out the way, mom. Get out the way, dad. Move. Let the greatest miracle take place and you be alive to witness it. Do you have a sweet tooth for coping mechanisms, drugs, alcohol, sex, food, cutting yourself? Come on, somebody. Oh, pastor, why are, why, why are we still stuck on stuff like this? Why are we always hearing this stuff? Why can't we change the channel, pastor? And you know, what? I've asked God the same thing. I said, God, when are we going to change the channel? When can we change the channel? And God said to me, when they change the channel, I'll change the channel. Come on, church. In all things, church. 
As believers in Jesus, what should our sweet tooth or our hunger and thirst always be and remain? I'll tell you, it should be our obedience to Jesus. Say obedience. obedience. And we can say it, but we have a hard time doing it. Yeah. First Samuel 15, 22, the man of God, Samuel, said it best. He said, to obey is better than sacrifice. Yeah. To heed is better than the fat of rams. Yeah. To obey is better than sacrifice. If your desire is to obey God at his word at all times, that means that everything else you have a sweet tooth for or a likeness for or a weakness for church will have to submit to God's way. Listen, that doesn't mean that the sweet tooth or that likeness or that weakness, it's not going to stop bugging you. But it does mean, church, that when the rubber meets the road, your obedience to God, it supersedes every other desire. The season of hunger and thirst for God, it's learning to identify and to address sweet tooths that we have been keeping. We've been keeping our lives, it's keeping us from full maturity in Christ. Why are we in the season of hunger and thirst? We're in this season to learn how, uh, how we get holiness and righteousness by taking inventory of the weaknesses that have been holding us back from complete, being completely obedient to Jesus. And his instructions. I'm here to tell you, if you want to grow, if you want to be better, if you want to mature, if you want to expand, if you want to go higher, if you want to get past this point in your life, if you want to bury this thing once and for all, if you want to quit being disobedient to God's commands and his instructions, if you want to quit the excuses, if you want to be a healthy believer in Jesus, church, you got to identify the sweet tooths that oppose God's intention for your life, and you must use God's word to conquer every sweet tooth of the flesh. If you want to mature, you can't do it without God. King Saul tried, and he failed. Why? Because he sought sacrifice over obedience. He thought that the Lord would be pleased with his sacrifice. But God says, I'm not interested. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not concerned about so much about the sacrifice as it is I'm about the obedience. Right? He thought he could earn God's approval by getting God to see his sacrifice. But it was obedience that God was after. Now, can I say this, church? If you do what God, if you do what God commands you to do, that when you do it, I'm just going to tell you, he already sees the sacrifice it took for you to obey him. So there's no need to sacrifice more than what's asked of you. Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we do that to us? Why do we punish ourselves? More sacrifice you know, and doing something completely different than what God asked you to do. When all the while, if you obey, God sees the sacrifice it was to obey him already. Right. There's already sacrifice included in that package. Scripture doesn't say that sacrifice is not necessary. That's not what I'm saying either. Scripture says it's better. In everything God commands you to do, he knows there's sacrifice in carrying it out. And obeying the instructions is fulfilling the required sacrifice. But instead, what do we do? We negotiate the sacrifice terms. I'm willing to obey on my terms of sacrifice, Lord. Listen, when you have that approach, I'm here to tell you, you're wasting your sacrifice because you're being disobedient to God's commands. If, this, if obedience is the goal, then sacrifice is the road you use to get there. And without a goal, then you're just walking a path that leads nowhere. And without a goal, it's sacrifice for nothing. But obedience is what makes the sacrifice worth it. I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my time doing something God has not called me to do. I'm wasting my time. How many of you are, feel like you're spinning wheels and you, have you stopped to ask yourself, is this what God is asking me to do? If you don't know, <laughs> pray. If you don't know, this is a great season to fast because we're all fasting. We'll, you will fast by yourself. We fast together. I want to seal this with some word. 
I'm not, I'm not done yet, but I just, I wanted to seal this with some word. Because you know why? We preach and teach about this Bible right here. And if this, this Bible right here, if this, if this word, if it has everything that I need that's going to help me to defeat every sweet tooth of my flesh, well, then I want to know where it's at. So let me help you. Can I help you out this morning? Can I give you some word that's going to go right along, right, with, with what you may be facing or going through or what you might face this week? Because I come to tell you right now, the devil is not going to, the devil is not going to uh, announce himself, right, a, a premature. He, he is going to surprise attack you. Found that out this week on the soccer field. The devil just attacked me, and I just found myself in a place where I was like, holy smokes, I can't believe this is happening to me. But then I remembered Psalm 39 and 1 and said, I will, put a mouth, I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence, Lord. Shut up, Sonny. You ain't got nothing nice to say. This is a trap. The devil's trying to trap you. How come I didn't see this coming? You knew the devil. You know what he's coming to do. That's why you got to stay prayed up and read up. So let me give you some word. Psalm 106 and 3 said is this. Blessed are they who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. What is doing right, church? I'll tell you, staying obedient to God. Psalm 112, 7 says it like this. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. I'm here to tell you, church, that, that you need to, that you need to, when your heart is steadfast, that means it's obedient. You are not news driven. You are obedient driven to God. Yeah, come on. Psalm 118 and 8 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I'm here to tell you, trust God's instructions. Don't trust in the sweet tooth of your flesh, church. Psalm 119, 11 says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee, right? Uh, it, his word is going to help you overcome every sweet tooth of your flesh. Psalm 119, 32 says, I run in the paths of your commands. I will run the way of your commandments with purpose. I'm here to tell you, church, that gets me excited. We should be excited believers to know that if I got God's word in my heart, I can run in the paths of his commands. I can run through this thing. I can run past this thing. This thing should not, church, it should not overtake you. Psalm 119.50 says, my comfort and my suffering or my sacrifice is this. Your promise preserves my life. I'm here to tell you, there is sacrifice, church, in staying obedient. It may not feel good, but if you stay committed to the instructions, it will work out in the end for your life. Thank you, Lord. That's where it was, Lord. That's where it was. You know, what's so interesting was if you read about Saul, the, before he became the apostle, you realize that, that he became blind when he encountered Jesus. Paul, Saul, in that moment, gained vision but he lost his sight. What do you do, church, when you have vision of where you want to go, but you can't see it? Because when the light left, the Bible says that Saul was blind and he needed help. But what did he have to do? He had to follow the instructions. If he didn't follow the instructions, he wouldn't have made it to his miracle. He wouldn't have been able to see again. Church, I just come to tell you, I know some of you, you have great vision. You know where you want to go with your business. You know where you want to go with your marriage. You know where you want to go with your children. You know where you want to go with your life. You know where you want to go with your health. You know where you want to go. You got vision, but you say, but I can't see. And God is saying, follow my instructions. What do you do when you got vision, but you just can't see where you're going? You know what you do? You follow the instructions. You follow the original instructions. You listen to God, what he said, and you move forth with it, church. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yeah, that is so good. Psalm 119, 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. I love this, and a light unto my path. God's instructions are here to guide you, church. I'm here to tell you, it's the only thing that's going to guide you. Oprah ain't going to guide you. <laughs> Jerry Springer ain't going to guide you. He passed away just recently. So I guess he can't. You know, I'm telling you, church, the only one that's going to guide you is Jesus and his word, church. 
Psalm 128 and 1 says, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. If you truly want to honor God and reverence him and please him, you have to have a sweet tooth, a liking for his word, church. Psalm 147, 11 says, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. You know that word delight in some translations actually means giggles. That the Lord giggles. He giggles over you when you're following his instructions. Can you just see God giggling over you when he tells you to do something and it makes no sense? He tells you to do something. (coughs) 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 Just giggling over you while you're going through this mess. Doesn't that make you feel all good and warm and fuzzy inside? That the Lord is giggling over you when you're following his instructions and it makes no sense. I'm supposed to give what, Lord? 10%? There's no one's in my account. But you obey God and this is God. (laughs) Why? Because he knows where this is headed. (laughs) He knows where this is going. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows when you obey him and you come to church, but your spouse ain't coming to church, but you still come to church. God, (laughs) Because he knows how this ends. Because if you stay faithful, woman of God, man of God, if you stay faithful, oh, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter. But you got to stay faithful and be desperate for his word. Pastor Hank said it last week. When will we be desperate and cry out? I'll tell you when. When we know this word and apply this word and live by this word. When you don't address the sweet tooth of your flesh, I'm here to tell you, you begin to live a double life. I mean, we just went through a whole list of possible sweet tooths of the flesh, and I'm sure there were many more we didn't cover. So don't think that you got away because I didn't cover you. The Lord just covered you. I'm going to tell you a hard truth, church. Jesus doesn't fill half-hearted Christians. I know we sang the song, fill us up, right? Fill us up, and I believe that. I believe, oh, Lord, fill us up. But I'm here to tell you, church, he wants to, but he doesn't fill half-hearted Christians. Jesus does not fill double living Christians. The Holy Spirit has come to fill those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what his word says. Matthew 5 and 6 says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. It doesn't say those who sometimes hunger or sometimes have an appetite or sometimes follow God's way or most of the time or 99.9% of the time. It says those who hunger and thirst for holiness, righteousness, those, God says, I'm filled. And I know we're, we're not perfect. If, you're not per- if, if you are perfect, please let me know. I will happily give you the reins and tell you, you can lead this church because I am not a perfect pastor. I'm not a perfect leader. I have flaws. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. But you know what? I thank God that while I may not be perfect, he is. And if I just follow him, he'll show me how to do better. Right? I know our flesh gets in the way in our pursuit to follow God's commands. Come on, it does. But let me encourage you. Can I encourage you, church? That's where God's grace comes in. You know that the grace of God, it doesn't just deal with your past, but empowers you for your future. The grace of God is not an excuse to keep the sweet tooth of flesh in your life, church. Don't abuse that grace. Saul, the New Testament, had a choice. I'm finishing with this. He said, stick to the old way or change, Saul. What was God asking of this Saul? Let me give you a hint. It's the same ask of Saul, King Saul of the Old Testament. Obey. Follow the instructions. And from the verses we read earlier, we find that this is exactly what he did. He traded in his sweet tooth for the flesh, for a sweet tooth for obeying God. And you know what the results were? He got filled with the Holy Spirit, and God sent him out to tell the world about Jesus. You know what God did to him, church? He introduced Saul to his purpose for living. How many of you want to know your purpose for living? Your purpose, I'm telling you, church, it is waiting on your obedience. 
I'm here to tell you that when you address the sweet tooths of your flesh, that's when you can better hunger and thirst for God's way for your life. And that's when you can make the conversion like Saul did, from Saul to Paul. God's asking you today, what new name is waiting on your obedience? Thank you so much for joining us here today. We pray that you were blessed and stretched by today's word. Maybe you need a prayer or have a question for us here at the church. Make sure to fill out our contact form on our website at thechurchphx.com and stay connected with us on our Instagram and Facebook at The Church PHX. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday at our 10 a.m. Sunday experience, either in person or online. And remember, we are the church, building a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you.